So good, um, good evening and welcome to this December 13, 2021 um, Committee of the Whole Meeting for the Village of Lake Bluff. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Eckerman. Here. Trustee Brion. Here. 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 Trustee Ryder. Here. First is our non-agenda item and visitor due for public comments. The Committee of the Whole allocates 15 minutes during this item for those individuals who would like the opportunity to address the Committee of the Whole on any matter not listed on this agenda. Each person addressing the Committee of the Whole is asked to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes. Anybody? Anybody online? No, sir. Let's move on. Uh, next is our general business item. Um, are there any requests to modify the order for our um, agenda tonight? <clears throat> now let's proceed. First is our consideration of the minutes from the November 22nd, 2021 Committee of the Whole Meeting. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. The second? Second. Any comments and changes? Thank you. Uh, Clerk, please call the roll. Is it voice vote? Um, anyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you very much. Next is our informational update regarding stormwater infrastructure planning. I believe this is Mr. Hanson. Yep. Sure. Is the presentation ready, Drew? I do. So in October, uh, we talked with the Finance Committee about um, potential sources of revenue for future stormwater projects. And the direction we received is to keep looking at the potential of a stormwater utility fee. Uh, so this presentation is uh, intended to kind of update you on where uh, we got to this point and what, we, what we've done since October. <clears throat> and here we are, the community of the whole. Uh, so we're going to go over um, our, our plan of action, what we're doing now in the future. Um, we have a, a list of projects that were developed a couple of years ago, and we're going to talk about those projects and uh, the amount of revenue you need to bond to pay for some of those projects. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, uh, the fee methodology, which is how um, our estimate right now of what the revenues could be pursued it and the billing rate, what it would take, take for an average homeowner to pay for this fee, um, credit opportunities, um, and answer questions. So um, the timeline was shared in October. We've modified it just a little bit. That, that is the next slide. Um, if you go, so then it's basically working through it over the next calendar year in 2022. And if, if we choose to implement it, that would start as early as the first quarter of 2023. Uh, there's a lot of policy considerations to take in and, and a lot of decisions to be made but, uh, that's uh, over the next year. Uh, right now we're trying to uh, we're trying to get money. Um, so we're talking with the state of Illinois, the Department of Transportation. They have not eliminated in their mind a solution which would take the stormwater from the viaduct and put it into the ravine where it goes now through a larger pipe. Uh, we have significant concerns about the erosion that would cause in that ravine. We're, we're not pushing that alternative, but we need to do a little more work with IDOT to convince them that that's not the best way to do this. So we're working on that now, and we are continuously seeking grants. Uh, and then um, we've talked to the county, and uh, those, those discussions continue uh, trying to find ways to help fund this. Uh, just to kind of go through, when you get federal money, you have to go through the federal process. The federal process takes time. so. We've uh, asked uh, Scott Griffith is here from Christopher Burke. Um, he has kind of given us a, a, a estimate of what a phase one engineering study would cost. Um, that process, if we start it now or soon, it takes about a year and a half to get that approved by the state. 
and the biggest thing in there is to define the layout. Um, you do all your environmental studies and identify any land that might need to be acquired. That concern for land acquisition is mostly in Lillian Dell. We have a 16 foot right of way. We try to put a six foot wide pipe through a twisting right of way that we may need a little uh, temporary easements or permanent easements in there to make this project go. Um, phase two <coughs> after phase one would the land acquisition process. That can last years or it can take months depending on you know, the negotiation with the landowners and how much land you need to acquire. If it's permanent acquisition or a temporary easement, uh, that time frame can expand or contract based on those factors. Uh, and then construction, uh, we're estimating for the project to go from the viaduct to Lake Michigan in about, about two years, two and a half years of construction. So I have yes. a question for you, Jeff. Um, so your current discussions with IDOTs are IDOT is advocating for the current the current setup to be basically revised or redone, and leading to a water to go to the um, to the um, west. I mean, uh, Sheridan Place Ravine. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're advocating for it, but they have said they've not ruled it out yet, which we had thought we had gotten past that point with our last study. So we're going to try to figure out what they need to see to be convinced that that's not the best solution. So, so my question to you is, how long is this going to take us to convince them that really it's not a good solution for our community? What do you think is mm -hmm. going to be the timeline for that? We, we I, I, How long something takes with the state? <laughs> I, that, that's a, um, I, I'd make a lot more money gambling if I could figure that out. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and so we have, we've had conversations with a head of hydraulics dealing with stormwater for the state, Department of Transportation. We've also talked with um, an engineer who's in charge of programming when when projects get funded and so forth so um, what we're trying to we're chasing two different things um, one is the state says we asked for this seven million dollars we said we think you should contribute that to this the deep tunnel project they said we don't have it right. yet but um, if you're going to ask for it we need to do a couple things. One is obviously we need to make sure we all agree that this is the right solution and that means eliminating the ravine alternative. Um, so <clears throat> we're trying to work with them to do that um, and um, we're gonna set a meeting with them and, and try to say, you tell us what else we, we thought we've already told you this once, you know, do we need to do this again? And hopefully it doesn't take that long. <clears throat> I can't give you an exact date. Two is we talk about doing phase one. That's another approach that a lot of grant programs that we've applied to we, we're, this project is way over the cap, right? So if we can break this off in, in, in baby bites, one of which is to pursue phase one and doing that work, that may help us be ready for other project funding down the road, but that's something that they said they would consider helping joint fund as well. Same, we would also, we're talking to the county about that as a possible Stosip project very soon, so. So just to, for clarification's sake, the water that goes underneath the viaduct daylights uh, just east of Evanston. It's, it's a few hundred feet east of Evanston, but it's, right. it's so it's that yeah. Ravine Park. Ravine Park mm -hmm. runs down Ravine, um, and they, and it and then it goes into the lake through there. So your concerns about keeping it that way, just for all of us to know for sure, mm -hmm. and the people at home, to understand why the deep tunnel project is preferable to what IDOT seems to prefer or su has suggested and what exists today. What are, we, what are we trying to cure, not just the volume of water moving through the viaduct and the flooding, but also what happens when that water, I mean, I kind of know because I live mm -hmm. in a house that it goes underneath, but I'm just wondering if you could explain why it's so important, this project, <clears throat> the way we want it to go, is so important to ameliorate any issues that exist today with where the water goes yeah. now. Right now, when we get a major storm, the viaduct is basically a detention pond. The water backs up in the viaduct right. and it goes through the existing 24-inch pipe. At, sometimes it takes two days to go through. Um, if we were to make that 24-inch pipe into a 48-inch pipe or larger to make the viaduct drain much more quickly, yeah. that doesn't add more volume of water because all the water still goes through the ravine but the velocity and the energy in that water with the larger pipe right. will cause much more erosion and will raise the, you know, we did a 
stabilization project in that ravine several years ago, it goes up a certain height on the bank where we expect a 100-year storm to go and it protects that part. If you were to put a much larger pipe in, then there would be a, a much bigger flow. It would go higher on the bank above those rocks and erode the sides and, and cause damage to public and private property. It's actually, right. it's actually a concern also from Elvola uh, for, because this is actually the first park of Lake Bluff. I know. And their concern yeah. is not that we, don't, we have water, this is made for water, but the flow, the sudden flow of water destroys the ravine. Right. And there is, from Surrey Moore standpoint, oh, for no, example, I, this I'm is. aware, and I learned all of this from George Russell, was that the water goes right underneath my parents' front yard. And I know that because I stood on the front mm -hmm. yard one year in 1986 and watched the uh, manhole cover go shooting up into the air. The velocity mm -hmm. of the water is tremendous. But when you're talking about erosion, you're talking about within that ravine that runs along Sylvan. Yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. And where we propose to route the water down Lillian Dell, we have a much better chance of building something in that stretch that will resist erosion. And it's a much shorter stretch from where that water comes out to the lake than right. I think it's about a half mile right now where it comes out. Okay. So it does beg the question it's because the ravine is so valuable to us, what, what we need to do to convince them that this is a project worth doing for so many reasons. Yeah. And it, it's an economic analysis on their okay. part. Okay. And we basically just showed them the cost of stabilizing the ravine, which I think we did already, and maybe yeah. just didn't see it, is <laughs> so much that it doesn't make it, you know, a more economical project to dump it in that ravine and try yeah. to armor it. And we'd have to keep doing that because the projections probably, I mean, we just changed what the parameters are for a 100-year rain mm -hmm. event, so we would just have to keep stabilizing the ravine, right? I mean, it, it just is going to, it, it, you don't just do it once. Yeah, and it also goes through, um, you know, some public property, but a lot of private property where we do not have rights to. Okay. So I understand we have a lot of material to cover, and we only have 17 minutes to go. <laughs> uh, so these projects listed here, it's $30 million worth of projects. Uh, you know, it's not to say that over time this would be the order and the exact things that we would do if, there, if a utility was established to raise money. I mean, some of these things are... 10 plus years out, but these are projects that have been identified to solve flooding problems in, in the worst flooding areas of the village. So after our last meeting, we talked about a methodology of establishing the rate by zoning district. Uh, we had Christopher Burke and Scott looked at some examples of parcels in each zoning district, made an average impervious area um, kind of established that 3,200 square feet would be our one ERU. And then this shows what the average annual fee per property would be for the different residential and non-residential zoning districts. Um, and this is based on a one ERU cost of $109, which was an, an average identified in the October um, meeting of all the like communities around here. And that produced a total revenue of about 620,000. That's a little plumped up because some of that money comes from us as village owns property with impervious surface. So that 620 is probably not, you know, it's a little uh, ambitious from that $109, but it gives a good example of what we could raise. You know, this was kind of a, a light dive. We're taking this in little chunks as far as having our consultants work on this for us until we get direction to go full bore. So. These numbers will change a little bit if we move ahead, but I think this is a pretty decent sample of what we have. And this uh, sheet came from uh, our finance department was looking at if we had a certain revenue stream, how much could we bond? So for a $10 million bond issue, we see a revenue stream of $640,000, which is just a little above what we just talked about we would get from being about an average community with that and that. The deep tunnel project, we estimate at 17. Obviously, we are pursuing grants as much as we can. We, we certainly don't want to pay $17 million out of our own pockets for that. But this kind of shows, you know, for the different levels of revenue, how much we could bond over 20 years and what that could pay for with that project list that we just went and Would you talk a little bit about the scope of the 17, what it also includes with regards to North Avenue? Yeah, so the, the 17 million, we had three different numbers there. The 17 was the the deep tunnel line, that basically assumes that everything in East North Avenue is going to get disturbed while installing that storm sewer. So new sanitary <coughs> sewer, new water main, 
sidewalks, curb and gutter, rebuild the whole street. You know, it's possible that some of those things won't need to be when we get into the, the final construction documents. So there could be some potential for that number to come down more so than the others, which are more just, you know, footage of pipe times a, a cost. But that is, yeah, that would, it would be nice to, East North is not in the best shape and it, it could use a redo. So that would be- And a, I'm sure residents would welcome curb and gutter. Yes, right? it would yeah. be a nice, you know, for two years of uh, inconvenience if we could put them a uh, very nice street back when we're done. So, you know, as we talked about, we looked at this by zoning district. This is our, our beautiful zoning map. Um, we also have had some initial, you know, discussions. Most communities have some sort of credits for um, people who already have a pond, other sort of controls if they're not you know, using the storm sewer as much as some others. Uh, but there is a trade-off to that. So we talked about you know, how much revenue you'd have to do to support a bond. So for every credit we give out, you either have less revenue or you offset that by raising the base rate. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of discussions about credits if we choose to keep going down this path. But you know, there, is, there is a trade-off every time we do that. So... Um, I guess I'm, do you have any questions? I, I, I just, I actually have a question from the page before where we're talking about the $10 million bond issuance. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the idea is that an average homeowner is going to pay $109 annually and that can service a 600, that can service a $10 million bond, it doesn't look like we can do anything with that. When I'm looking at the chart, like mm -hmm. we can't do anything with it. So realistically, we're not going to be charging residents 109, right? We're going to be charging them more in order to get a higher bond issuance. So we can actually do something. If we, um, and there are some other alternative revenue sources that we could use besides just the utility collection to bond more. And like I said, we're trying to find seven million dollars from the state or two and a half million from the county. There's always trying to find more money. And if we do complete the phase one, that makes our project a little more, you know, shovel ready, they talk about. So when pots of money come out, if you're a little further along, not five years away from construction, sometimes that makes your application more palatable and more And do we have an estimated cost on that phase one on the phase one project? It's about four hundred thousand. Sixty to four hundred thousand. So, like reasonable, yeah. And <laughs> ideally, we'll get people to share that with. When us. you're talking thirty million, right? yeah, it's, they're seems, giving it away. Yeah, that seems reasonable. <laughs> and that is uh, that is just I think for the seventeen million dollar uh, viaduct project is what we would be pursuing the phase one for this time. And I just had one last question, just given the nature of what's going on with the federal government now um, passing. Um, I think it's the Build Back Better. Mm -hmm. um, do we anticipate that the state will get more grant money based on that, that we will get allocated some more grant money and potentially we can actually get more grant money from the state? I know the state has continually been telling us. We like, hope we so. We believe the state will get more grant money. There's always a big fight with Cook County and Lake County when that comes to Illinois. I think we also have, uh, um, I forget their name, Drew, that the grant service that we yeah, employed uh, is so looking we, out for us as well. I have been um, reaching out to our uh, represent representatives, um, so uh, Representative Schneider and uh, representative, local representative, even our representative, yeah. Morrison and Morgan, and the point is we have advocated for what we think is right for Lake Bluff. Some of these people actually got, got stuck in Lake Bluff with high water. This is awesome. And <laughs> so they're actively aware of the issue. And so people have said, you know what, when there is money, we will keep you in mind. And um, uh, Jenny Morrison reached out back to us saying, okay, do you have a plan? Can I please have a plan? Because I need to put that plan on a list and there, will, there, will be a, there is or there will be a list in downstate to actually put our project and I support your project. Okay. okay, that was a conversation. So I got the project from uh, Drew and Jeff. That project was <coughs> shipped to Julie and I hope for the best. Frankly, this is the state of Illinois, so I don't know when that will come to fruition. Great. Thanks. Okay. We are trying to make sure this project is top of mind of people who are sometimes coming across money and trying to think about how you know, who needs it and what would be a good use of it. Great. We're being a pest to everyone. <laughs> That's the way to describe it. Yeah. I just wanted to ch about the methodology of <clears throat> and, and uh, spreading the wealth a little bit here so it's equitable. Um, my understanding is everyone uh, who's a landowner in town, regardless of their status, is going to be paying because we have you know, um, people come before us and ask to waive permits, and we do that for mm -hmm. nonprofits like churches. But here, I assume because they have large parking lots, et cetera, 
we're not going to be doing that because, as you rightly point out, there's a price to be paid for that. So my question would be, as we get deeper into this, um, I mean, I know there are some mitigation strategies at the target development. There's the, the detention <coughs> pond and there are uh, detention tanks at Pasquazy, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure we're, that, uh, because I discussed this with Drew earlier today about credit applications for homeowners who have taken mitigation strategies like I have, but when you have large parking lots, you know, um, I, I can just see commercial entities maybe objecting to this and how we would handle that because, you know, that, that's going to be a substantial cost to them. And uh, I'd, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Every util utility fee usually comes with some sort of a policy that, you know, we'll obviously discuss over the next several months to try to, I mean, I think we'll have, if we keep spending money on uh, consultants on this, I think the next step would be to have them kind of pull together some examples and what other communities are doing. And yeah give us a place to start and have those discussions and the impact of revenue versus uh, fairness. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Just to see what Northbrook or Libertyville, Lincolnshire, anybody who's instituted this and how they go about dealing with their commercial uh, buildings who have, you know, have yeah. huge parking lots. Yeah, yeah, and I used talk to work in Wisconsin and this is much more prevalent up there. So I've okay. seen a few of those going as well. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to um, say that, you know, we want to have a solution that is, it's easy to execute, it's elegant, it doesn't have a lot of um, complex calculations in terms of, you know, here's my yard and here's a, you know, four foot square patch of, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, I want to keep, I want to keep that in mind and I, I believe that's going to be part of whatever, um, you know, matrix is developed for, you know, the calculations. It's, it's going to be a simplified one, and it's not going to be that homeowners are going to be calculating and recalculating and um, applying. Um, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be, again, an elegant solution that is easy to implement, that staff does not have to keep reassessing and recalculating um, for individual homeowners. Um, and, and I would assume that the biggest piece of this is, again, going to be the commercial piece. And so that would be the main focus then of we need to really critically look at who are the commercial entities that this would be the greatest impact on and what is the most equitable way to, to address that individually as opposed to individual home parcels. That the commercial piece of it is going to be probably the one that needs the most individual, um, you know, inspection and analysis before we move forward, correct? Yeah, I mean, the goal is that as much of every dollar that is collected goes into the ground as a project, not an administrative cost. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Of course, the one challenge I think is that a lot of the commercial, the biggest commercial entities we have are west of, so the, the stormwater <laughs> doesn't necessarily flow under the viaduct, so they may object to paying this because they don't have, you know, impact, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas, mm -hmm you know, homeowners may say, hey, wait a minute, I've done blah, blah, blah. And mm -hmm. so I do, I do hear what you're saying. I just think there's going to be this tension. So I'm <laughs> gonna, I'll be interested to see how we go forward with this. Do you already have a, uh, um, um, a simple uh, calculation algorithm for, for that? Well, I mean, if you look at um, the... So far, the assessment portion. The AP zoning is pretty much just canals. And I mean, that is $35,000 in this uh, uh, example based on their impervious area. So I mean, they may object to that or they may not. I mean, it's uh, some, somebody certainly in the village will object. I mean, it's a matter of having a clear credit policy and um, everybody always asks for exemptions, but I mean, that's kind of a matter of how, how we're gonna write if we go forward. The ordinance. But to Kate's point, does it matter which watershed a property is in, right? It just matter, matters that they're in Lake Bluff, that they pay this fee, even though their watershed may be uh, not having, not causing the flooding problems on the west side of Green Bay. Yeah, and the thought being that even if your property doesn't contribute to the flooding, you use the village streets, you I see. benefit from the improvements. Mm -hmm. And you're a community partner, ultimately, right? 
Jeff, I had a question about how other communities handle um, <clears throat> like schools and um, other taxing bodies. Yeah. So, because essentially, right, when we pay our taxes, we pay taxes into the school. If the school now is going to have this large fee that they have to pay for stormwater utility, um, that's essentially going to come from tax my property tax dollars, right? And then on top of it, then I'm also paying $109 extra every year. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, so yeah. is, there, is there a way that communities have dealt with that? Or is that, is that just, do they consider that part of like, you know, you're utilizing the school, it's a community partner, you, so we kind of all pay into that, and that's... So I, I did estimate the schools as well, it's about 18,000 based on their parcel size. Part of that is this is a user fee, not a tax, okay. so that generally all the users pay the fee. And I think there's, and Peter's not here, but there is a legal reason that you try to make it fair and equitable by doing the, the fee to all impervious service uh, properties. And you're right, you do get pay your tax to pay us. There are also different you know, populations, members, like the park district isn't exactly the same boundary as the village and neither is the school district. So mm -hmm. um, by charging the fee equally, it kind of makes it a little more equal for the village residents. And there have been situations where other communities have had the benefit of needing storage on like school property. And so they work out, oh, and, and for lease of these fields for this purpose, then you've satisfied your, your credit since you're serving the greater community. You know, so there's super elegant ways that we would love to find, right? So we can maybe, if, that's, if those exist, we're looking for them, so. Okay. I guess I was just thinking more of like, a, like a, a person who's not utilizing the schools anymore, but still lives in the community. And it's not, you know, it's mm -hmm. now, I mean, essentially it's paying twice. So I'm, not, and yeah. I, you know, that was just my. In the uh, the institutional zoning, like I said before, is the least consistent. You know, some of these like R1, R2, there's not a whole lot of variance in impervious surface house to house, so it's generally fairer. We may need to look at the institution a little more closely, like the golf course, which is kind of ignored versus for the calculation. <laughs> yeah, where the library is almost all paved. Yeah. Versus you know something in the soccer field, it's a little different and. To make things simple, we've kind of assumed, you know, one impervious area per zoning district, like some of these um, non-residentials, maybe 75% of the parcel, but that does vary a lot more for schools. The churches are more impervious than the schools. Okay. And that okay. is something we'll have to look at as we go through. Thank you. I just, I know it gets very granular very quickly, especially when it comes out of my purse. <laughs> you know, it, all, it always does. <laughs> But I would just encourage us to try to step back and say, we're looking at things that individuals could never accomplish individually, right? There's, there's no way we can attack a problem like this as an individual. We can do a little piece of it. And so we always need to step back and say, what's the best for the whole? And as this entity has the ability to impact a larger swath, it's a great responsibility, but it also gives us great opportunity to, again, accomplish things that we couldn't as individuals. And so when we're tempted to get granular and say, well, this little thing here and how does that, this little, let's compare and who, we, we've got to step back and say, wait, what's, what's the big picture? So even if this little thing is a little more or less than that little thing, that little piece over here also benefits from the big picture, which we all are trying to accomplish. So I just would, I would just encourage everyone to understand there are times that we get granular and it's often and it's quick, and there are times that we need to look at the big picture. And that's gonna happen a lot in something like this, which is you know, new, new, new ground for to us. To your point, um, this is a very good point. To your point, the only thing I have in mind is we're tackling an issue that has been plaguing us for 75 years. Chronic. Literally. It's it is an issue that we, this is three times our budget, okay? It's not a thing we take lightly, and we really try to find a, an elegant solution and really resolve it for multiple generations. So if we say that I am paying for it, but really I don't see why I should be pay, pay for it, I actually get credit, I actually get benefit from the community from other things that are not necessarily seen in the first place. And so we all work as a community, as a group of people, going to resolve a thing that is essential to us, that is 
I might want to go to the school. I might want to go to the hospital. And guess what? There might be a flood and I might not be there. Mm -hmm. And so those are the direct issue that is there that would be affecting me. It would probably will not affect me in my, my lifetime. But as a community, we're all helping each other. Regis, if I might, to that point, for mm -hmm. those of us who live on the other side of the viaduct, um, this is also a public safety question now that the Knollwood Fire Department is closed. Mm -hmm. So uh, the response time is changed every time the viaduct floods because they have to cross the railroad tracks, which is possible, but not that easy. Mm -hmm. So even though I advocate for the opportunity for people to apply because they have engaged in mitigation strategies, I do think that, uh, and I, I agree with Barbara's point, you don't want to get down in the weeds too deep, but it can be sold as a public safety issue for everyone living in the north, east, and west terraces in, and, and elsewhere, the sanctuary, Tangley, et cetera. My question, though, is to Barbara's point, while this is elegant and we need to be able to articulate this, what is our, cons uh, our um, plan for a sunset provision? Because this should have some, uh, this can't just go on and on, right? We have a project, and this is used to debt service that, and I'm assuming that has been thought of. So we've talked about that internally, and right now we don't have a date and because this is, this is just, if you look at this and think about this as a utility, think about our water utility, right? We have an enterprise fund. It's there to cover all the existing infrastructure and new infrastructure should that come along. This is only planning for new infrastructure that doesn't exist today. It doesn't even account for the budget scope, does not include like replacing all the pipes on the North Terrace or, you know, these things that will have to happen someday. So. We don't see a sunset in our lifetimes, I don't think. And, but okay. I mean, it's this is something that if the village wants to maintain this type of investment, like we've talked about previously, in other assets, you got to get a new stream, and it just it's not probably going to go away anytime soon. I think that's something to be considered, just in the sense of people's reaction mm -hmm. to this. Being one, transparent, at least. Yeah. One person's fee is another person's tax, and I think when people see this, um, we like to think of it as a small amount of money, but you know, every time, as Barbara points out, you reach into somebody's purse, they say, hey, whoa, wait a minute, I have a lot of, what's there, going on here? There's a different way to consider that also, that is, we probably have not invested as much as we should have invested, and we're stuck into other people kicking the can down the yes. road, mm -hmm. and it is time to actually tackle those issues that yes. are affecting all of us. Yes. Yes. Um, and I would say, I would keep it as in mind as, no, we need to go and address all the different things for the whole community. Well, then, and what Drew's point is, I think would be good for us to flesh that out and say, look, we're looking at maybe, and, and give us a, a, you know, we tend to think in such short terms, two, five, 10 years, what are, what are we looking at? It, we aren't gonna be sitting here, the group of us, but for the next people that come along 20 years from now, so that residents can have a sense of what we're trying to do as a legacy for infrastructure so that we don't do what we just, I think there's 100%, I agree, we are just holding the can that's been kicked down the road. So maybe flushing that out would help people as we're trying to communicate with residents about why we are doing this. For sure, and I mean, this is just to, I mean, stick your toe in the water, but you think about the, uh, let me go back to, this image, I mean, there's a total, how many study areas within that study, Jeff, 10? I think there were seven, but that study did not go through the whole hundred percent, right. There's some smaller areas that we didn't do, and we know that there's flooding in other places that aren't identified in that list. That I think this is only three. <laughs> this is three of the seven. And that doesn't, again, account for existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And how many miles do we have, Jeff, of storm sewer? About 30. 30 miles, existing today. Right. And I just, I just like to add, of course, I, I want, I, this is a community project. It's going to benefit everyone. But I think it is good for us to ask some detailed granular questions just to get people thinking, like, how are we handling this? And have we thought about that so that, um, so that we can go back to the community and say, hey, we flushed all that out, yeah. and here's where we ended up. Yeah. So, I mean, I, my intent is not to, to whittle it down to the point where, like, we're you know, it's crazy for you guys to try and be managing this or whatever, but I am going to ask those questions because I think they're important that we at least talk about them 
yeah. flush them out and we get to a point where we're all comfortable. 100%. And, and just, I mean, tonight's goal was to say, like we said, we're going to bring back something that you, we're going to throw up against the wall and get some, it sounds like everybody seems comfortable with what we're pursuing. So we're going to keep going, keep working on this and bring it back again as soon as we can. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is an incredibly important subject. And frankly, I, I really want those answers so that we can be comfortable with the community going forward with this is what we're trying to achieve for that amount of money that is consequential. But we also have the capital improvement program for 30 minutes. So if we could move on. <laughs> yeah, so again, we're finer and finer points. It's going to keep getting. Yeah, right. I, I really agree with Joy. I think it's 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 good to get a little bit uh, detailed because we have to we have to explain this to people. They're going to ask us those kind of questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Next is our uh, fiscal year 2022 uh, capital improvement program. Jeff. Yeah, so we do this every year, meaning December, where we kind of go through the, um, the capital plan and where all the projects sit. Uh, and um, some of these don't necessarily look like capital projects, but they were budgeted as capital projects. We took everything that was in the capital plan and the budget, plus a couple of things we've added during the year. Uh, and we've total of 25 different projects that we're trying to make progress on this year. Uh, is pulling up the next presentation. So yeah, we divided them into ones that are complete, um, we're working on, and ones that uh, we're still trying to get moving. Uh, so the largest completed project, I guess, is probably the bridge. This was, uh, we have a police officer who's also a drone pilot, so he was there that night when they were <laughs> placing the beams, and he took some nice photos for us of the construction of the McClory Bridge. That project turned out very nice. I haven't heard any complaints about it. It uh, seems to be well used, so I was very happy with how that finished. Um, we've also completed the, the annual street resurfacing and patching in the sidewalk and curb and gutter project, uh, finally complete. Um, and then we had two lift station projects that happened almost at the same time, uh, September and October, which are also completed. Public Works is happy about that. No more false alarms at two in the morning from these places. So we are, uh, should be good for many, many years. We're not the most beautiful projects to, to think about, but uh, they're very needed, and the people who live on those streets will be happy to know that you know they're not going to get backed up. So, and I, I actually only think there's like only one more pump to be rebuilt in our entire sand sewer. There is. Well, I never want to say we're done, done, but yeah, we've done a lot of work on lift stations. A lot of investment has been made few here. Years. We've been able to kind of get the same controls at a lot of different stations, so they're easier to operate, easier <clears> to get data from, and uh, it's really worked out well. Water meters, so this is a, there's a large number of projects we call in progress, and this is 98.5% complete to some that are probably less than 10% complete, but um, the water meter replacement, we'll talk more on the next slide, is, is just about done, just some stragglers out there. Um, we've changed about 1,840 meters. There's 29 on my list yet. Uh, a few of those are people who just aren't comfortable with us in their home at this point. Some of them are uh, plumbing issues that we're trying to get solved there was an issue in lake bluff is that the resident does own all their plumbing out to the streets so there is some cost to the residents uh, so we're trying to work through that and some people we just haven't gotten a hold of for two years some houses are vacant but uh, we've been whittling that list uh, united meters was our contractor up until april they did the vast majority of those and then jake's uh, public works guys tony in particular has been going and no, he, know, he knows that list pretty well by now. So if he sees a car in the driveway, he's knocking on the door trying to find out. If that <laughs> appreciate his efforts. Uh, really been knocking off some some hard ones. Uh, we did our, our first guess at you know the impact on our water loss. Um, Glenn was working on those calculations quite a bit. Looks like we went from about 20% to 14%. Uh, we're gonna 
tighten that number up. What we found out is our, our meter, uh, that meter's water leaving the water tower is probably not all that accurate. So we need to get that calibrated to get better information. But it is showing an impact uh, on our water loss. So that's what we'd hope for. That's, that's good news. Uh, you go back up one, Drew. There's a couple other. So the hydrant flushing was one we added. Um, we did some of those this fall. The rest we'll get in the spring. We're going to flush uh, and, and um, flow test 100 hydrants. Uh, water main replacement and pump station 37 is a state project where they're requiring us to relocate our water main out of the way of their project, which is over by Canals and Skokie Valley Road. Um, those were bid together. You'll see that contract at the next meeting for approval for late winter spring construction. It, scale, can you give them a number on that, what we're expecting? That is a, uh, I forgot, $700,000 contract for water main replacement and that state-led project is 200 to 225 of that. So it's a, it's a big deal. There's not a lot of room in the right away at 176 for a new pipe. So it's causes us some headaches. So the, uh, the streetscape, uh, they're done basically for the year. We're hoping they'll come and uh, we'll get the, the seat walls bricked and, and finished. And then in the spring, we'll get the lighting and the trees, the final landscaping. That was a uh, um, kind of an adventure, you know, day by day working downtown. But I think uh, it, it worked out really well. I was happy with our, our on-site um, consultant dealt with a lot of the business owners and I, I don't think we had a whole lot of complaints more questions than complaints which is, which is always good and I, I think it looks nice I'm happy with the product we got from the contractor so just got some punch list items if we could keep the kids fingers out of the concrete that would help but I say they're kids maybe they're not I don't I don't know but we got some uh, stuff to pull out and redo in the spring uh, but not, not a whole lot um, Asphalt path repaving, you'll see later too. Our contractor kind of failed us on that one. They bid more work than they could do. They did not finish. So there's a contract amendment in the next meeting to get some concessions from them, have them finish up in the spring. That is mostly Tangley Oaks uh, redoing the paths around Armour Drive. Um, crack sealing, they have had to cancel a couple times because of wet roads. That's like a half day work for them. They may be here later this week to do that. Hmm. All right. uh, we talked about some flashing. Sounds like a public safety. Hold on. <laughs> and back on the last slide, we're trying to increase the um, safety of the crosswalk to the elementary school across Green Bay Road. Uh, that is ready to go into the state for review. I don't know that the state's going to approve that or not, but we're going to apply for it and see if they will let us do that. In the past, they have not indicated that they wanted that in there right away, but hopefully they will see our, our thoughts on making it safer for the kids to get to school. Uh, Did I hit the wrong button? I'm sorry. Did yeah, you and then Green Bay, Green Bay Road, Road yeah. we are going to reapply for Council of Mayors funding uh, this winter for probably construction in 25 or 26 now. The big issue with that is the bridge and the state historical Society wants us to save those iron trusses on the Green Bay Road Bridge as you go south out of town. And we sent them a report saying that's not the most, that's not the best solution for the community. Um, we'll get their final opinion on that in March or April. All that work is 80% federally funded. So we're following their process and their process might tell us we have to chip those things out of their existing concrete and try to salvage them. So we will see if, uh, we'll see how that goes hoping that they will see our way. Uh, just a couple of small things in progress, stormwater and the bottom one, the utility planning we just talked about. What you're seeing here is a slope that has failed a couple times uh, at Birch Road. So we're developing a plan to extend that culvert. We may need to get an easement from the adjacent landowner to try to make that slope more stable. And we've done a couple of miscellaneous projects, a little money left in that budget. Uh, basically, when somebody's sump pump is pumping in the street and it's causing ice all winter long, we've been trying to take care of small things like that, little drainage issues with that project. Sanitary sewer, um, another contract for later today is some manhole inspection. We've had some inspections done already. We have a kind of a roster of work that needs to be done. Those inspections will complete that roster. We'll put out some improvements out for bid for 
It's listed separately, sanitary sewer improvements and Moffat and East Witchwood Basin improvements, but that's all gonna be kind of one project. Um, and then Tangley Oaks, we've rebuilt two of the three pumps there. We've budgeted to rebuild the third one, but something else is that was broken when we did that, so we fixed the broken thing. But uh, in January, we'd like to send that third pump off to be disassembled and uh, have them, you know, put it on the operating table and fix it. So that will probably be a waiver of bids too, just because by the time they take it apart, take it to their shop, it, it doesn't pay to try to bid it out and have somebody else look at it. And then, yeah, pending, the underpass handrails, trying to get something out to bid here probably in January. That's a tricky project because it's a lot of IDOT messing around for a welding contractor who's not used to that, but we'll get something out to bid to try to repair some of those broken sections of handrail. Uh, get the water tower washed this spring. Uh, the valve and hydrant replacements, I kind of put that on hold till we got our water bid because I wanted to make sure we had enough money for that. We also had two disasters of water breaks in the last couple of weeks that were pretty expensive. So I'm trying to get the uh, impact on the budget of that before we commit more money. And basically small water leaks are just hard to find, especially in Green Bay Road. Because you know, when it, it's a blowhole, you can find it very easy when there's a fountain, <laughs> but when it's just a leak on the pavement and it's gonna freeze, we had a, a couple of days of searching around for that. Um, and then the, the footbridge you see on the screen, we had budgeted to do some repairs to that. I had talked with contractors. They thought the consultant's recommendations would be very hard to implement because there's some rusted beams that are gonna be hard to change. Um, had another consultant look at it that basically said that, you know, for the price you would pay to rehab the existing bridge, it's more than 50% of the price of replacing the bridge. Um, and given the age of the bridge, we'll talk about this in our budget discussions, but I think my recommendation would be that we have a few years before there's any significant structural concerns that we try to get a, a budgeted to just replace it with a wider bridge similar to the Gurney one. Uh, I love that bridge. And that is our uh, 25 projects. So I take any questions you have. Thank you. Questions? Comments? I love that bridge, by the way. The but green but one? Is, but it's Lake Bluff, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bridge. I hope it doesn't change too much. Mm -hmm. What? How old is that bridge, <clears throat> I think that is from the 60s. Yeah, it's been the same my yeah. 50 years here, so for sure. I hope it doesn't change too much. That's pretty cool. Well, I think it will probably ultimately end up looking like the if other If we foot. replace it, it'll look like the Gurney Bridge. I and mean, that's a precast product that is yeah. I mean, a pre-made. They sell that bridge a lot of places. That's probably what the most economical solution will end up being. How much is a bridge like that if we were to replace it? What would you have a budget for that? It's, I have to, I don't have the number. I think it's about 300,000. Okay. It comes in in two pieces, one from each side. They bolt it together in the middle. Um, unfortunately, there probably is some tree removal to get a crane in there to put those pieces out. But that's, uh, that would be the project. Thank you. Any more items on this board? So that would conclude this meeting. Uh, could I please have a motion to ad adjourn this meeting? So moved. So Thank moved. you. Second? Second. Thank you. And this concludes this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs>